replicate the force that they had just felt. So it's a very simple task. Now the prediction here is that when they're trying to replicate the arm, because when they press, they cancel the sensory consequences, they will actually feel less than they should. As a consequence, in order to replicate the feeling that the robot gave them, they will overcompensate. So if you look at the light blue here, this is what healthy controls do. Across a series of forces exerted by the computer or by the robot, they try and match them, and th this would be perfect responding, this dotted line. And they are consistently above that. No matter what the force is, whether it's 0.5 to 3 newtons, they're well above the line. In patients with schizophrenia, they're actually closer to accuracy. So they're closer to this line that would indicate perfect accuracy. Now, you could argue that's just difference in sensations or something, but if you take another task, a control task, where they don't use their finger to replicate the force, they use a joystick. So here they can't predict the sensory consequences so easily. They're actually, both groups are on, pretty much on the line. So when they're not predicting sensory consequences, they're not attenuating and therefore not having to overcompensate, then everybody's accurate. If the control subjects are predicting the sensory consequences and therefore attenuating and therefore having to overcompensate, they're well above the line. But the patients seem not to predict so much and are therefore uh, more accurate. We've actually run this again on 30 subjects and shown that your degree of accuracy correlates positively with delusional inventory, and this is in healthy subjects. Um, this is not a startling correlation, but we are running more subjects anyway. Um, so your tendency to be more accurate, you don't overcompensate, is greater if you're more prone to delusional-like thinking, which would be exactly in keeping with the, the Shergill study. Now the other study, before I present you with the final results, was one that James Moore has devised, and this is all about the fact that we compress out action outcome experience in our mental clock space, if you like. And all that you do here is that you're instructed, you're watching a little clock revolving, and you're instructed every so often, just whenever you feel like it, to press a key. And sometimes that will be succeeded by a tone, 250 milliseconds later, and sometimes it won't. And sometimes you will be asked to say, where was the clock face when I pressed the key? Or where was the clock face when the tone occurred? So you're making a subjective judgment of where you think things happened. And under normal circumstances, this is reality. So the actual events are occurring 250 milliseconds apart. If there's just an action with no tone, you're very good at estimating where you're, when you press the key. If there's just a tone with no action, you're very good at estimating when the tone occurred. But if your action produces the tone, then you tend to estimate the action as being later and the tone as being earlier. This is called binding, temporal binding of action-outcome relationship. So you compress things in time. Now, interestingly, in people with schizophrenia, this binding is actually even closer. What that means, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but essentially, they show a stronger binding effect. We've recently shown that the degree of binding is actually modified by whether the tone was predictable or not, suggesting that there's more binding when it was an unpredicted tone. And also, in people with schizotypy, this effect is greater. The effect of prediction error is even greater. So the background personality and the level of predict unpredictability in the environment seem to fundamentally change the way you experience the action-outcome relationship. What we've shown in this palatal response, which we've already hopefully established, is to do with outcome-based responding, is that actually force matching is significantly um, worse in people who show greater palatal response. So they are, this is sort of more like the schizophrenia end, where they're very accurate. So the people who are most accurate are the ones who fail to show the palatal response. So just as the people who fail to show the palatal response get the greatest symptoms under ketamine, so the people who fail to show the pal palatal response show the most schizophrenia-like responding in this task. I won't go into this one in detail. This is less convincing, and I think we certainly have an outlier here. But in this small group, um, the palatal response to um, the action outcome, or the Pavlovian transfer, is predictive of a greater degree of action outcome binding, which again is the most like the schizophrenia people. So once again, the failure of a palatal response is predicting things that are more like the schizotypy end of things, more like the schizophrenia end of things. There. 
I, in some ways, I apologise for throwing those data out. I'd be very interested in what you make of them, and you may want me to unpack them a little more. But these are straight from our most recent study, and I was quite excited about showing them. But I'd like to just finally uh, synthesise what I've been saying, so that at least there's a take-home message in the midst of that welter of data. So the strongest point I want to make is that perception is inference, therefore inference is perception. I don't think we need to invoke two factors to explain delusions. And I think that recognition of that, and it has been recognised in the past, but rec ongoing recognition of that may be important in the way we schedule our, our studies. I think that prediction error can be considered as a sort of fuel that drives inference and therefore ultimately perception. And I think this raises the possibility that a disturbance in the signal, the prediction error signal, could help us to explain altered perceptions and inferences, delusions, that characterise psychosis. Could that be the case? Well, I think there's some face validity. If you look at the early stages of delusions, then that could be incorporated within what you would expect from disrupted prediction error. We also have observed that the neural signal for prediction error in a simple causal associative learning task is clearly different in people with psychosis, and it also seems to correlate with their likelihood of having delusions. Furthermore, um, you can find a comparable, a highly comparable pattern of change in people who have a, an artificially induced psychosis-like state. I don't think ketamine is you know, exact an imitation of schizophrenia. I think it's a good model for the early stages of psychosis. Moreover, and this is where I think uh, we might be in exciting territory again, is that the, the baseline measure of prediction error in healthy controls predicts their vulnerability to positive symptoms when they get given this ketamine challenge. And it's also perhaps predicted by schizotypal personality features. Uh, sharper eyed among you will notice I have not mentioned a single gene or polymorphism. I haven't, I mean, I, this is not my field. I, I would really like to know if these, if what the genetic underpinnings are, of this are. As you'll have observed, our studies are far too uh, small for that, at present at least. Um, and finally, in a study of action outcome learning, two prediction error dependent tasks show individual variability that is predicted by. Uh, specific engagement of these outcome action associations in a, s a separate task done in the scanner. And I think that's possibly offering us an important clue about the nature of the prediction, the action and the outcome in, in psychosis. But it would be foolish of me to just leave it there. I think there are major limitations with this and you may have spotted them already. Um, there have been previous models that have invoked interaction between current input and stored experience. They haven't solved the problem of delusions. What hope have we in reformulating in this way uh, of doing that? I think one thing that um, mitigates here is that we now have the wherewithal to link psychiatry very closely with basic cognitive neuroscience and thereby draw on a whole goldmine of background neuroscience and psychology research. And I think we may be in an unusual position now that we weren't in. Uh, 20, 30 years ago. I haven't talked about the underlying neurobiology, the dopamine system, the glutamate system. This model needs to incorporate that if it's to have true explanatory, um, explanatory value. Of course, prediction error is has been related directly to dopamine, but it's also been related to glutamate. Ketamine has been related to glutamate, but also to GABA and dopamine. There's a lot of complexity here, and people may wish to um, comment on that. And finally, the, the model helps us to think about the emergence of delusions. Why are they bizarre? It doesn't tell us why. If I fail to uh, predict the sensory consequences of my actions and then they, they therefore feel surprising, why don't I just think, oh, I failed to predict the sensory consequences of my action? Why do I instead think that is somebody controlling me with radio waves? You know, the delusion has a, a content that is not fully explained by this model. Why do delusions persist, even in the face of apparently contradictory evidence? I think one answer to that is that, um, having said that an inference is a perception, once the belief forms, then the evidence is maybe disregarded more easily and is indeed changed in the way it's perceived. Why do they emerge at the time they do? Nobody's really explained why schizophrenia tends to occur in late adolescence, um, and how would this model fit with that? And finally, what about the emotional component? Well, I've alluded to the work that's come from here, suggesting that predictions and inferences um, relate directly to the, the uncertainty of the world and thereby to the extent to which it engenders anxiety, makes you fearful, makes you ultimately paranoid. I think there are lots of er areas to be explored in that respect, but this model certainly doesn't encompass them at present. So with those caveats and limitations, I would like to thank you 
for inviting me, for hosting me, for staying, even though there is another very good lecture on. Um, and I'd also